Okay, I'm going to start recording here. Yeah, so talking about Siraj, does he have open source experience or not Not particularly? Maybe if I cut off the video, it might help to lag in. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I hear you most of the time, but every once in a while, once you start speaking, it's, it's going to help. Really? Yeah. I was asking if Siraj has good experience regarding open source, or he's uh, working in a proprietary world primarily? Uh, mainly in proprietary. Um, mm -hmm. so. Is he open to open? Yeah, he's open to open. He has worked some in Free Academy in Blender and, and in open source, uh, and worked in Linux as well. Yeah. Even if the main tools he has been using has been professional or paid for tools. So he's a, he's a guy that lives in Taiwan? Yeah, currently he lives in Taiwan for the coming six months. Uh, is he Taiwanese? He's Indian, sounds Indian, but is he there as a visitor or has he been there for a long time? He's there to set up his business, basically. Uh -huh. So he's in the stages of trying to set up a business. So uh, for him, this would also be an opportunity to kind of grow his own well, business and, and network. Um, so he with a part-time contract at the same time and see, kind of prototyping this one and see how it goes with, with this workshop. The business is uh, his consultancy or, or some production business? Um, I'm not sure what the new one is because I think that's, that's something he, he got quite recently. Um, but before that, it was consultancy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if we look at the schedule, April 28th through May 6th is our next. That's going to be like a big one filament maker focus so if we talk about an a may event the, the april 28 may 6 is the the right time to go now for me that's still hong kong time but there, it's still like up in the air as far as the hong kong is gonna it appears whether that's gonna happen or not because uh, i mean flights are shut down so i kind of can't get my ass over there <laughs> yeah. but apparently it, it's supposed to be getting better um really well um. Well, if you look at the statistics, there's less people getting sick. <laughs> if well, that you is, call that better. That is true. Um, I'm, I'm, well, I have my opinions about uh, the statistics, which comes from the mainland. But uh, if you look on models, at least the models that I've seen, it seems to, to be peaking around June, at least in Europe. Oh, oh OK, yeah. OK. Would you say that, therefore, the, the Hong Kong is not likely then? um probably not although they if they start with containment earlier then it's possible um mm -hmm. so it's not impossible but i think we should definitely plan it as if it's not possible <laughs> yeah in which case the april 28th through may 6th uh, i'll we'll do it at factory farm that's a good place to do it if i'm not traveling yeah. uh that was where we wanted to debut the filament maker focus which where we can get the torch table up and running and cut the parts and have a solid five days of good development on that. Uh, yeah. But the um, thing right now is the marketing part. So if you look at the my the OSC YouTube channel, just take a look at I looked into 180 Degree Consulting. So they're a, they're a company that runs ways and volunteers, primarily uh, university students that are getting experience. Mm -hmm. And really nice group i mean they've got some high profile clients and these are top students at top universities so uh, i applied with them to get uh, product strategy and marketing assistance mm. so that's really mm -hmm. um that's that's i think that's really like the most the place where with least amount of effort we can get the highest amount of value currently yeah what would you say for because, I mean, um, my mind's on the, the marketing side. Like, I um, think the product is good. We need marketing. The How do we, like, if you were to, what would your suggestion be to us right now? So basically what I'm doing is, uh, so Steve, my marketing mentor, is helping by first we're getting trying to get clarity on target market. And from then we just simply, okay, let's reach out to all the places that have that target market. And there was a lot of confusion, just to summarize where we're at on the marketing, there was a lot of confusion on the five-legged dog versus standard markets. And, and it appears that the consensus 
is that the five-legged dogs are too few and far in between, so they cannot be relied on for scalability. Therefore, who's going to pay the bills? And it seems like the market of simply makers. I mean, it's like no kidding. Uh, but there are established venues for makers, so that's kind of where we're looking at makers. And then I'm also thinking, okay, well, makers and students. So students on breaks. There's a lot of breaks throughout the year that can happen. Yeah. And students are definitely idealistic students who want to save the world and be ecological and yeah, and definitely. have a vision, right? So, so that's kind of where we want to go. So I think with the students, on the one side, there's make like makers like Make Magazine, like there's other venues we can, you know, hack a day, other places where we can try to post and maybe targeted ads on maybe on Facebook. Uh, and then as far as the university students, I, my approach would be to, I mean, what do we do there? It's, I would say, look for every single open source club, engineers without borders club, all, the, all those kinds of progressive open source related, DIY related, engineering for good kind of clubs or entrepreneurship clubs, social enterprise clubs, all at universities that we should just reach out to them and say, hey, we've got, uh, we'd like to set up chapters. So I think the, the vision for the chapters is exactly what 180 degree consulting does. They, they have scaled since 2007. I was pretty impressed. It's like, I want to study how they did it because they're, they've got 135 chapters and apparently they're quite active. Chris, welcome. Uh, we're talking about 180 degree consulting, Chris, and uh, this is on marketing. Let me send you a link to, to this. Uh, so this is, I talked to them today and I'm going to get some help from them uh, so you can view that. But talking about school, school outreach, yes, all the open source related public engineering enterprise development clubs and just reach out to them. Just reach out to, like I would go through the student organization office and find people uh, th th I've looked at like for example Brown University um, yes great student organizations galore that may be related I, I looked at some open source clubs at universities a listing by Mozilla reached out to some of them uh, some feedback I got at least one guy who I'm setting up a conversation with one professor who runs an open source club at, at RIT Rochester Institute of Technology Mm. Uh, he's really interested, like saying, yeah, we can take on projects. Let's, how do we collaborate? Yeah, cool. So, cool. so to sum up that, that conversation in marketing, I, I think universities would be a good thing to, to reach out through university clubs, all related to the kind of stuff that we do, which is quite comprehensive, but just select like the most fitting clubs along certain keywords of open source, collaborative, public engineering, and so forth, environmentally friendly eco clubs um whatever is it there what do you guys think of that to reach out through university clubs i think that's a great idea okay to find participants and collaborators like uh, i mean there could there could be teachers in there there could be yeah um i think participants. yeah i think the pitch there is like we want to sell the like from the so there's good stuff happening with high schools um the, there's so we're, I mean we're getting pumped up for June. June looks like we're gonna have a really successful month because so I'm signing a contract with uh, Seattle account. No, this is first of all uh, Pacific Ridge School. So that contract is in. I'm signing that. That's in the mail. Uh, and they're basically a captive audience of at least 12 people that are gonna participate and probably will fill it to 24. Um, then there's Cary Academy on the East Coast. And then there is Seattle Academy of Arts and Sciences. So all three that we talked to had great conversations. You can see it online on a, on a YouTube channel. Uh, see the conversations there. But that's lining up. And the idea that I'm trying to propose there is, okay, let's do a, the global classroom where we finally get, like, after we get, like, 12, 12 groups aligned, we do visible massive collaborative development so for the university audience it would be like let's start an osc club and we get together with other clubs to do a design session like every you know every set every weekend or once a month where we can move forward on actual technical design in a significant way because we've got all these clubs that are collaborating so through that of, of course also we have access to training like to propose to people let's tr let's start an osc club 
Now we can also train you to do the steam camps. And then of course post this stuff up about the summer of extreme design build and then the incentive challenge later on. So trying to get this whole product strategy of how to move this forward. But I think the universities and schools are quite the audience, absolutely. Now Steve says that, uh, so my marketing mentor, he says that, okay, be careful about the just the two day events because he's he's being firm about do it four days or nine days because then you really get the people who are interested with the two days you don't get people so excited about the design and collaboration aspects there's just not enough time so i could see that it definitely like if you commit to four or nine days that means you're pretty hardcore uh, with the two days we might expect less but still if it's if it's still people getting our printers and stuff like that that's still decent but to him missing that deeper vision of like getting absorbed in it and filtering for the the people who are going to be the long-time co collaborators but also one of the recognitions is that most people are not going to be i mean probably like talking to katarina about that here it's like probably 95 to 99 percent of people are not going to be the five-legged dogs which she identified as that's a mental was a mental block for me because i'm saying i'm trying to fit these five-legged dogs into this package and the fact is going to be that they're just going to be rare and they're going to come up to the woodwork here and there but those aren't going to be the peop people that pay the bills because there's not enough of them it seems like so that's my, my assessment of the situation also i mean working in teams has the benefit that not everyone needs to include all perspectives um so maybe having a bit more team approach then you can have some people who are really entrepreneurial and someone else who is very let's say technical and then together they manage to, to build something together. Um, if we do this thing with schools, for example, um, it might be a really good idea to, to include more students. And then I think having them run kind of independently, but like each and have a very simple uh, package that, all right, if you want to run an OSC chapter at your school, then these sort of things, these sort of steps you need to do. You need to uh, uh, mm -hmm. apply here, you need to follow this, and then you choose a, either you get assigned, uh, let's say a certain machine, it might be that they yeah. get assigned a element maker or they should choose one. Um, and then they kind of work on that. And then every two months or so, they they release their new iteration of the machine or, or mm -hmm. something. So there, there's this clear goal for them and then they can organize mm -hmm. themselves. Um, I think that would be easier than us kind of organizing what they are doing. Um, I like I think it. a little bit. Yeah, how, yeah. Um, for example. How do you get um, the retention in this thing? Because it's like, no, that's always the thing. But then, like, how do you get people to stick around? Like, what is the glue that bonds this together? Like, like talking about 180 degree consulting, they've grown like crazy. Yeah. Uh, so across it, chapters, yeah. what do you think? I mean, if you look at uh, people in volunteer work, which this will be to some degree at least, then for a lot of people, it's the social factor. Um, and for some people, it will be the idea. I think it's around like 30% who, who are there for the ideal. But for a huge proportion of the people, it's the community. Um, so combining the sense of community together with this ideal, we might get a combination of people and we might get people who stick together. But there will always be problems with retention and then will, there will be a small percentage who stays there for a long period of time and they will do most of the work. How, um, do, you, how do we address community? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, so I would start with a collaboration architecture. So. We say, no, this is not just engineers. It's going to be engineers, business people, artists, and like 10 different disciplines. So so start by calling out for a dozen disciplines. And then we talk about, so then a meeting, maybe like one meeting a month or a couple of meetings a month. Um, if we take 180 degree consulting, they say they spend like four hours a week on an average for a student. But see, that's mm -hmm. a pretty amazing commitment. Like, holy cow. Um, but we got to call out for a bigger picture calling out a collaboration ecology of like t 12 disciplines um because we can ha we can put a lot of people to various roles or around any project like there's uh, any project requires a team right yeah. so say 12 disciplines we've got the ted talk and the vision people like that they definitely like that and it's a definite selling point but then 
so outside the collaboration ecology, what else? That's the only thing I can think of. It's like that's that's a cool thing. Enabling tools like okay, here's uh, you're building physical artifacts, uh, 3D printers, other things. Uh, build your. It has to be like we have to call them out to say build your makers like the OSC makerspace, the OSC microfactory at your school. Like it's got to have tangible and social aspects. Comments. Just thinking. Um, have you had any work on your unique value proposition with your marketing guru? Uh, maybe uh, it's really good at marketing. Well, I mean, it's collaborative design for a transparent and inclusive economy of abundance. It's all we yeah. got. We're trying. The next step is to um, try to identify that for the target market. And Jessica and Chris were saying it's just makers. Forget the five-legged dogs. Just makers and students at universities or high schools. Yeah, um, because that's true. And then the uh, five-legged dogs emerge, however they do come up through the woodwork. So maybe something, if, if you imagine the five-legged dog and you would sell the idea to this person, which address all of the dimensions, um, maybe if we will just create a two, three sentences line that kind of address all of it at once that might actually help um as it is right now i think it's tilted a little bit towards technical people and we need people from from the both entrepreneurship perspective but also people who are there for the social factor so we get kind of a more wholesome picture uh, you mentioned 12 disciplines are these 12 disciplines which are already identified well i can list them right now architecture engineering business marketing environmental studies creative writing i mean for engineering there's like you can get specific on that what else we got that's only six one two three four five six what's the other six uh, then add six more engineerings. <laughs> no, uh, this is the which overweighs for engineering. Um, mm -hmm. Social media, media studies. So the studies, there's computer science, that's eight. There's um, production engineering, like um, there's video, like video, like. Um, Film, film and multimedia. That's nine, uh, and then three more engineerings. Uh, what else? What are what other um, university departments, schools, landscape architecture? Did you say architecture? I think there was. Mentioned. Yeah, I s said architecture. I think landscape architecture, urban, urban. Des landscape design, urban, urban design, landscape, yeah. plus urban, uh, social work. Oh, are, are you listening? Like all, uh, all like depa know. departments or schools at a university. That we say, hey, we, we're calling all out, calling you all out. What about the English majors? Yeah, English majors. The guy, Keshan Huang, who's one of the leaders of the 180 degree consulting, he's an English major, English slash economics major. International hmm. affairs. Yeah, uh, the guy I met, <clears throat> Ishmael from UK, who came to the Belize event. He's a student in international affairs. He wants to be a a diplomat. Uh, but that kind of that's like twelve right there. But it's essentially like all disciplines. Um, all right, that's quite broad. Right, but I mean we can handle that, right? So um, the first 
the first person who comes up with the idea at the local university should somehow be tasked with finding a diversity of people. So that's probably someone who's interested in, in entrepreneurship or business mm -hmm. or product management. Uh, so those might be the first person who starts driving it and then they mm -hmm. are tasked with finding these people and putting up the first meeting mm -hmm. and deciding what their product will be about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It could be the, the plastic recycling micro factory. It could be a, I don't know, it could be a 3D printing business. Like we have technical things as businesses, but what are the other aspects? It could be a, so, a software business that sh like a design year, a business that focus on a software side, say like you're designing your 3D printer, but, but then we have the construction set to actually build it. So it's like an app that you can make printers with. Um, I mean, it could be yeah. anything, could be anything. It's up to the people, but we want to still keep track of that. Okay, it's still about the global village construction set, so en enabling tools, but the kind of business that can start up about something could be all kinds of businesses. It could be like an Airbnb-like business, which gets very ambitious up to building panelized modular housing. You know, like that's crazy, but that would require like 50 chapters to work on that together. That's yeah. where I think the power comes in where we um, say we're solving problems larger than ourselves. I'm thinking how Amnesty International does it. What they do is that once you are a team of people who want to work on something, you decide which country you want to work on. And then you contact the people who run it in England, and then they will assign a case, a case from that country right to you. Uh, so it might be something similar that it, maybe they want to work on, let's say, uh the data science maybe they want to to somehow do something with data science and then maybe we assign them a case of how to use let's say augmented reality for design or artificial intelligence for design and someone else might choose 3d printing and then we might uh, give them a product or, or at least an example product um, that's something which i'm thinking because we still have a list of things which might which are necessary so that we don't end up with everyone developing the same thing because they develop what I have heard other people talk about and then everyone you have you know 10 groups who all works on 3d printers for example and maybe no one who works on filament extruders um, yeah I mean it would depend who, who shows up to the table so that's a discussion for later but any team would have would want to have like all these different aspects like if you gonna and I think focus it on an entrepreneurial aspect so entrepreneurial technology for good like um, has to be entrepreneurial so that people are actually linking the the livelihood part to the to their future but I think we can sell this on a on a thing it's like okay micro fact like OSE chapter teach steam camps design tech that matters uh, build your own micro factory like student groups will have access to a space and then they could get funded for making their OSC development space like a hacker space so build your micro factory yeah anyway but I I think um, I'll write up something to that effect because I'll, I'll, I'll start sending out emails I already have started like what I was pitching is uh, are they interested in in collaboration or starting a student chapter of OSC but I gotta kinda think work that out a little bit and I was thinking of how to crowdsource it like if we were to get assistance right now if we could allocate some money so the, the guys from 180 degree consulting they're gonna charge us they're a volunteer organization but they're gonna charge us a thousand bucks for a three or four month project I'll gladly pay that um, but if we were to allocate resources to any other things that we can execute right now what would that be to get uh, to get the product um, strategy out there and people hearing about this because right now it's like people are just not hearing about it. we t we tapped out our internal audiences essentially at this point um well we need a marketing budget i'd say and uh, allocate some some money for twitter ads they're quite cheap even if there's not so many people use it so allocate some for facebook and there, as, as mentioned last time, to use the targeted uh, Facebook ads, so we don't waste money on people who are not interested. So how do we how do we measure the results? Is there a way to, clear way to measure? 
Yeah, because we we install analytics software and then we can go in and, and see who who clicks on our links basically. Um, so each of these tools have have their own suites of analytical software. Uh, do we need to set up like because we had that discussion with Michael, who's we're using um, what's it called? What are we using for our analytics? Um, we're not we weren't using yeah. setting up Google Google Analytics. Yeah, he set up. Different. Is that going to be an issue that we're not set up on it? Um, yeah, if we're going to use it, then we need to be set up for it in order to get the analytics from it. Um, I mean, it's still possible to have like Google AdWords where you write down which type of search words that you want, but it's it's probably better to capture that from our web page so we get people who are actually similar. Um, well, we've got Google AdWords for free. It's a question of like having somebody manage it effectively. That's a that's a deal. Um, um, is there like a so it would be a very so say say we can do some stuff like say targeted Facebook, right? That that sounds like a no brainer, right? Yeah. Um, how do we measure its success? So we set up a campaign. What happens then? How do we measure it? So we measure how many goes from clicking to the ad to buying a ticket in the end. And we can track that through Facebook or we have to do some other thing? We can track that through, um, uh, as I understand, we should be able to track it through Facebook Pixel, which we will install on our web page as well. Uh, what does it take to install Facebook Pixel? Sorry, what it takes? Yeah, to install Facebook Pixel. Is that a, What do we do there? Is that a back back end thing, or um, I would guess it's some kind of API. Uh, so we need to set up an account um, with Facebook Pixel, uh, and then our web page would interact with with their API. At least that's how Google's services work. So it's probably similar with Facebook Pixel. Um, so no back end work on our back end. Like we don't need to inv to involve Michael, or is he required to set some stuff on a back end? Yeah, he probably need to have some to. Um... Are you running WordPress? Yeah. Yeah, you would just need to put the pixel code somewhere in the um, uh, checkout. So somewhere that they would only go that you know, just to paste the code somewhere where they would only go if they were successfully converting. Oh wait, but so is it, that something you edit through through? Like I can, I am, I'm an administrator on uh, WordPress. I can do that, or do we need yeah. to? Uh, yeah, anywhere you can paste HTML code so okay. that you could do it. In, in, uh, as long as you only would want to put it like on the uh, thanks for buying, uh, you know, on whatever's the the landing page for you know a successful sign up. Well, or you know, if depending on uh, how you wanted to run the ad campaign, you could call a conversion. Uh, they actually bought a ticket, or it might be better to say, let's call a conversion. They. Uh, Clicked through, that, that they actually showed up and read our copy here. You know uh -huh. that they actually um, that way. That way, at least um, you can separate success b between the landing page itself and the marketing campaign driving people to the landing page. What, what landing page would we use? Well, I, I would say, I, I mean, honestly, because uh, depending on what platform you're buy, you're might be buying ads on, um, you may, so may not say, be able to let's trust. Say Facebook. Fa like, let's do Facebook. Facebook. So. So I definitely don't trust what uh, clicks that they report. Uh, they would say we sent uh, fifty. You, you know, we showed five thousand ads. We sent fifteen people your way. We would want to put that pic, uh, tracking pixel on our on the uh, on the landing page that we were directing people, so that we could say yes, in fact, fifteen people showed up here. Uh, and, is that, and that verifies that that has happened, or or no, they they yes. fake the numbers. <laughs> no, that way they they can't they can't fake it because uh, well, in, in theory, the pixel would only load for a real life human that actually went to the thing. Um, yeah, so that, that, way, that way we actually Vera can validate their numbers. We actually can. Uh, Have you done uh, that, Chris? Uh, um, I mean, not. Uh, yeah, pr yeah, pretty much. Okay. Yeah, More so maybe... or less. I mean, not in a long time have I actually ran any campaign like that of just did back end, back end type stuff. But um, maybe, yeah, maybe we could we could try that. So. Um... What's it cost to do a targeted ad? Like, uh, depends how many people you want to reach. Or... Mm, yeah. 
Yeah. And I don't, I've never bought ads in, in fire. I've never, it's been a long time since I've ever tried to buy, buy ads in general, but on Facebook, I'm not, in particular, I'm not, not familiar well, with. I'd love to get some, something like, yeah, I mean, yeah. can we track some, some resource or something where we, we say, okay, so this is our investment and this is the likely ROI from that investment. Like, so that we're not just yeah. spend money and it's like, we don't, we, we don't know if it's working or not. Um, I mean, I like if we're in a position where we say, okay, we dedicate this budget and, and this is the statistical ROI on that budget. I mean, can we get to that point? Or it's, it's less, yeah, less clear yes. than that. So, so yes. So right now, if we assume, so right now, what sort of statistics do, you, do we have on uh, the website? We have had what, however many signups we've had and then uh, divided by how many people you have have organically come to the thing. I mean, I know, or uh, I know you said we've done a lot of advertising within OSC's immediate reach already. So that's going to be a different than any campaign that we are, we're running. But, um, and what we can do is say, yeah. for example, we want to spend maximum 20% uh, per person or per profit. So for example, if we were getting $2,000, then we might want to spend Four hundred dollars on that, in order to get yeah. and, and try yeah. to get. Let's say we, we would try to get three people, and then we take twenty percent of how much we get from those three people, and we see if it works or not based on that, and then we can assess the situation. Um, but, but yeah, spending from twenty percent of our profits is is not too much. Um, so twenty percent of profit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so then that would, you know, would depend on how uh, how many people, what the, uh, how many people we're going to sign up based on how many people we send there. Um, so, it, and that would depend on how uh, relevant uh, we're able to actually target. Uh, in Facebook's um, advertising platform, they have just like boost boost your posts kind of just simple direct boost kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do. Is there a reason why you wouldn't want to just just do something straight along like that? I mean, are they only going to show it already to the people who would have already seen it? Uh, well, I don't know who the boost goes to. Like that, that's just like you boost it to yeah. more people. What's where does it go? In theory, in theory, they they would be looking for people who are you know, are the people like the people who already like the thing. You know, in in theory, they, they would uh, not just pick random people. That would be, uh, there would there would be some reason. Behind well, why also, when we boost posts, it's possible to copy uh, previous profiles. So it's good if we capture a profile first and then we boost the post to that um, to the same profile. Oh, can, you, can you elaborate on profile? Yeah, what's that? Um, yeah, so um, it's also through through Facebook. It's um, there's a function which is called. Um, uh, let me see what it's called. But it's, it's basically same audience. So it captures who clicks on your existing pages um, or your existing Facebook pages, and then then you can copy that profile, and then you know, okay. when you a new ad, uh, it uses that information. Um, so you don't need to put it out manually. You can also put it out manually who you think your audience is. Um, no, no, no. Yeah, I like this plan. I like this plan because there's probably a lot of back end. The OSC is a big page, has a lot of data uh, of pe people coming through. They probably have a good profile of of that um so it could be as simple as spend a hundred bucks on boosting of this uh, of page and see how many how, what sort of engagement it, it drives um mm -hmm. the question is if uh if that makes is how, how many people actually click and then uh, we're looking at that number uh, we well, we're gonna have to kind of guess what do we think the actual conversion rate would be if a thousand people looked at it how many signups would we expect uh, mm -hmm. well, but we, even getting even so getting a thousand hits will be difficult yeah, um, like for example, I, I'm clicking boost post. It says, okay, I accept, what's it do? Um, send to people up to your website, get more people to react, blah, blah, blah. Uh, post special ad category audience. So, I mean here like on a boost, it just people who like your page, people who like your page and their friends. Let's see. So. Um, yeah, so I'm thinking. Is there, a, is there like the same that function does not exist there? The the idea of the 
boost through the profile that's yeah, not there. Let's see. What is it called? Um, so how do we do this profile deal? Yeah, I'm thinking if um, Chris, yeah, um, maybe you and I can look a little bit on how to capture the profile and then how to to sure, sure. send the post to the same place because I didn't hear Mark and Martin mention that um, send to the same audience. It might be that he doesn't have Facebook Pixel if that's required first, but maybe. You and I can look at what's required in order to to send to the same audience. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Facebook, Facebook provides a pixel for their conversion uh, in order to prove their conversion tracking. Is that what that how it works? Sorry. Yeah, so Facebook uh, provides the uh, conversion cookie or tracker. Um, I don't know how it works, but if it's only within Facebook or if it's, it works together with Facebook Pixel for someone who works with uh, uh, events, who has some marketing for events. Uh, so I had a chat with him, and that's what he recommended. Uh, then he mentioned I see, I see. Facebook face, uh, Pixel. He said also that it's, we shouldn't uh, advertise a group. We should um, advertise a page, Facebook page, and then we shouldn't just um, use these uh functions which is Martian mentioned now but but we should first capture a um audience place that audience and and it will do it yeah. uh, i don't know the te technical parts exactly how to do it but i can come back and we can look at it uh, from the back yeah maybe. i imagine i can i can help um so if we, we can do that we can see how we capture profiles um, and then how to to use that to retarget our existing ads. It's possible that we first need to to buy some ads um, for it to collect some data. Uh, huh. But uh, let's let, then. That's also sort of the same guy who said that Twitter ads are quite a cheap way of reaching a lot of people. Um, Interesting. We do it in the right way. You can do it in an expensive way and in a cheaper way. Um, so let's put together an SEO strategy until the next week, basically. Can we do that? Yeah. Um, yeah. And have a suggested budget on how much to use for yeah. some people. Um, and yeah. then the next week we, we execute it. That's when you say search engine optimization, I mean, if we're pub publishing to ads to certain pages is that seo oh yeah no, uh, social media search engine well, optimization hmm? i thought search engine optimization was just about how a search engine finds your website yeah it's still um if we want people to find it it's important that we use the same keywords um throughout the different pages and I also think it's good if we start to reach out to for example um, uh, schools that they use something such as Eventbrite because Eventbrite is already very trusted by Google so if each place has an Eventbrite web page and all of those links back to our place for the, the larger events then we will get a lot of a lot of, and if we only go through uh, our existing existing channels. For example, what, you, is not a, it's, uh, yeah. um, what is the like for SEO? Is it um, what's the number one thing? It's embedding a certain keyword code on top of H and within HTML within our pages. That's one thing, but it's also to have to be linked from trusted sources mm -hmm. uh, and from a lot of trusted sources. Um, because it weights different web pages differently. So if, for example, BBC would uh, would link to it, it would be different than than if you would link to yourself from a private blog. Okay, that sounds good. Which is why it's good to have 
larger web pages such as even right to link back to us so if we start to use those channels as well then we get more width, uh, into our web page are you saying that if, if somebody else like like who like for example uh give me an, give me an example of someone who puts eventbrite on their thing for say the the april steam camp how do we do that what do you mean so what i mean is that if we have uh, let's say we have student organizations uh who are running osc development uh, groups or teams that when they meet up they don't only meet up uh, behind doors until they're gonna have their workshop and then they, they advertise it but instead they have uh, on on event right um or meet okay, for, in that case also about meetup, on meetups that we meet every week once a week and then once it's time to have a workshop they also have oh yeah so they could so the chapters were, would naturally be open to the community yeah yep yep and then if that's the standard way of doing it then each chapter would uh, generate traffic and it would have a footprint and then all, when all of them link to our actual event then it would be much more uh, it would get a much better ranking mm -hmm. yep okay so SEO strategy for next week then um, and social media strategy. It was actually social media strategy. Thinking about uh, Facebook and, and Twitter. You have some right. time to to uh, work on that. So who's committing to what on that? Anything? Yeah, I can do some this weekend. Uh, Chris, how does it look like for you on on Sunday? If we can meet up on Sunday or Saturday and discuss Facebook, and then we can focus on that part until next week. Yeah, that, that would be fine. I, I, um, that, I did work in the advertising industry, so I know about the advertising in general and backend and type stuff. But Facebook, again, I'm not, as a platform, not, not familiar with, but I'm happy to help figure it out. This weekend, I'm going to be working a lot on uh, getting the, uh, uh, a, a bunch of OSC stuff, including getting the PyTab um, together. So I'm, um, uh, well, yeah, that could definitely fit in with, with whatever else I'm doing. Uh, let me see. I'll just, yeah, just let me know what time I can put on the calendar. Um, all right. So how about this time on Sunday? Sure, 2 o'clock. Um, daylight Savings is on Sunday. Um, I think that's Sunday night, though. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. It works? All right. Yep. I'll send you a link. Awesome. And just some email with some information as well. Yep. And feel free, to, feel free to pass around. So there's a teacher's video on OSC. I don't know if you guys have seen the teacher's instructor recruitment video. It's up there. Mm. Yes, it's it's very nice. I like it. Yeah, so take a look at that. Yeah, um, and the key to making the seemingly oh, impossible oh, oh. possible is instructors like you. Yeah, so the link there is for y'all. Yeah, but that leads us into the curriculum for the next week. So, so to su to summarize for next week. So, ne let's see. Next week, oh yeah, I'm going to Australia, N New Zealand rather. Um, so next weekend. So as far as curriculum, so day one is tight. Day two is pretty tight. Now day three on the Arduino part. Uh, the only yeah. thing we have to resolve on that is the CH340 G chip on the, the, Ar the Arduino thing we used. Did that end up working for anybody, Michelle? Did that end up working for you or by connecting that pin 13 to ground that thingy? Uh, I was looking. Did anyone get the Arduino to work on your side? Um, the. Peter made one on the breadboard. Yeah, uh, did it work? Not, not the one on the on the storyboard. Oh, okay. The one on the breadboard did work, but we used uh, another uh, converter. I bought like a package yeah. with three different converters with different chips, and uh, the 340 we didn't uh, manage to get working, but one of the other ones did. Uh huh. So, so uh, I have to look into it. Let's see if that's on Peter's log. Oh uh, yeah, cause I, I saw another yeah I saw a thing online like um, with the other one the two one o two or two one o four chip 
which had the DTR, the, the data terminal ready pin uh, available. It didn't have DTR also, uh, oh. it, but uh, we added um, a button. Uh, well, the, the, the button that wasn't in my original design, we added it. And by resetting while uploading, uh, at a certain point it works. Yeah. You, yeah. You have to push the, the reset button a few times. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's a controversy there. Yeah. Oh, but let's see. Do we? Um, let's see. Arduino. Let's see what I see on it. Well, I I did uh, like solder um, um, the, um, the capacitor to pin 13 on the on the chip itself. But uh, yeah, that didn't help. Like the DTR pin. Right. Uh, like, yeah, like Tom uh, suggested, but uh, yeah, it didn't work. Yeah, there's some. Let's see, the one with the DTR pin. Did you guys try that one or no? No, no, no. Uh, all three didn't have a DTR pin. Okay, so the one with the DTR pin, like I saw one online, uh, I was looking into that, like it seems clear that it would, would work without any trouble. So I'm going to pursue getting that particular chip. It's, um, yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at that. Yeah, so well, that's... The, the chip, the, the, the 340 chip, it has, the chip itself has yeah. a connection, uh, has yeah, a yeah. DTR pin, but... Uh, it's not connected. Yeah, yeah. the converter uh, is not always connected. Right, right. Um, and was there any issue where any of the other chips like the let me see um i'm gonna look at the diy arduino page i put notes there so take a look at this yeah like um usb to silicon with dr pin on top like that one yeah the notes on there's the FTDI version that works on the last link there on YouTube. Dear yeah. friends, welcome back. Mm. So I think I want to make sure I get one that I, that I test before I fly out, fly away. Um, make sure it works. So the workflow there, I think I think it'll be useful, Chris. What do you think to to start with a breadboard, and then we we get that, and then simplify the thing for yes. and, and try try the whole drilling and the art the the a in steam where we just draw the things by hand just like we did last time uh do you think the what do you think of that approach so we we do the breadboard one then we do the circuit board where, where we definitely try the the cnc whole whole drill sure. and then we, now so if we are if we're drawing um drawing uh one, there's also the option of using the plotter to, to plot one um, in marker. Well, uh, if we use the chip and load it on, you have to go through hole. So yeah, you can, so what I'm thinking is we we do the through holes with a CNC drill, which I think we, we have enough experience to do that. And then once we have the drilled holes, we do the second step, which is to draw the actual connection to like the super minimal Arduino, like just have like one or two channels, one channel even, and don't connect any pins that we absolutely don't need. So, so try that experiment where we draw the things by hand and then we have a leeway on where we draw the things and we can have a pretty rough sketch and it would, could still work uh, because we're connecting the holes that we did with a CNC drill. So we space them out as far as we can for all the components and then we etch. What, how does that sound? Does that sound logical? That sounds good. Chris, you talk? Yes, I think. Yes, I think. I think so. Okay. I did super far on the Arduino last time, so I'm I'm, I'm not um, not as confident. Yeah, I think the breadboard. If we start with the breadboard, and that could be a. I think that could be a. A fulfilling part in itself and then we yeah. say uh, we get the success on a breadboard which is I mean I think that's pretty cool that you're you know you're putting together these simple components from scratch and then if we succeed or not there'll be a good experiment of generating G code and using um, using code that we generate 
two, do the basic <laughs> drilling. The drilling, I think we should be able to handle it. Um, the European guys have shown it reasonably well. Um, Michel, what would be your comment be on uh, like the difficulty of the drilling operation? Like if we're just to drill holes and then then draw with the marker connecting between the holes. Certainly doable. Uh, the, the only a bit of a problem that we have had uh, was uh, with mm -hmm. the auto auto leveling mm -hmm. uh, with the Z probe uh, because w especially in in our case because. Uh, Oh no! It was with holders. Uh, it was the five, uh, the five hold probe. So, uh, but still, it had problems. Um, we we put like a, a wooden plate on it mm. uh, on the on the on the surface, uh, and then on that we we wanted to put uh, the um, uh, the PCB, mm -hmm. uh, but it couldn't measure like through the the wooden plate. But a, a way to solve that is to put um, aluminium tape on it, I suppose, or even maybe just an aluminium foil. Then it would um, measure to, uh, so, to to the surface of the wood, actually. Um, yeah, it was uh, the only problem we had with was was with the leveling. Okay. Uh, well, I we think can figure that out. It's it's pretty straightforward for. Well, I think there's a simple way to do that. So what we do is we just leave the metal bed, we level without the board, and then glue four magnets to the circuit board, and then right after the bed leveling is done, we just attach the board right in the center, and then it goes. How about that? Um. Yeah, uh, if if the um, yeah if it can drill into the the magnets and it doesn't drill too low that it goes into the metal plate because um, well I would do I don't like know if the drill that can uh, can handle that like the PCB board is very thin copper layer and then uh, epoxy doesn't have a problem with that but but with uh, a steel plate so uh, yeah. Well, I'm thinking, so you put a magnet on each corner and then put like two more magnets. I mean, we have magnets are easy. Once yeah. you have one, you can attach as many as you want to get like a, you know, half a centimeter offset. So you make sure you don't go more than like half a centimeter down, which is, yeah. I think, yeah, should be perfectly yeah, fine. Could, uh, yeah, that should work. And yeah. uh, just, uh, yeah, uh, there shouldn't, yeah, there shouldn't be any holes uh, under above the magnets of course right so, exactly so we put uh, it you know put the chip in the middle and you know space it and make sure we're away from the corners i'll yeah, try that see yeah, see if i have time to try that beforehand yeah yeah that would be a good solution yeah mm -hmm. and then and then we're uh, moving forward on the pi tablet the fourth day so uh, for, for the drilling code yeah. uh holder he exported it uh from I, and he didn't use flat cam. He just like added yeah. some uh, some code in the in the text editor. Uh, he added some uh, some G codes. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, yeah. one way to do it is you can, you know, we can prepare a file that if you're stepping off to the side by 0.1 inch or 2.54 millimeters, we can easily do a manual file where it's basically like. A bunch of lines in a row that we can generate just manually. I mean, that's that's one way to go as well. If we don't use KiCad to export it, because what happened there was I think he, he used KiCad. I mean, what, what did you say? I think Hol Holger used KiCad to export, right? Yeah. 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 The, I think we can follow that. File and the uh, and the drill file. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think we can follow that. Um. Let's make sure we just document that as much as gleaning everything from the last steam camp and putting it together. I was going to ask, Jessica's not here, but I was going to ask her to do the the plotting. She was the best one at plotting workflow. Uh, she made a lot of notes in her log on it. So I'll ask her to, to write that down as a, like a one-hour lesson. Um, what I'll do is I'll work on the Arduino lesson so we have that for the next, you know, for this time. And we really get... I really want to see the thing where we do it on breadboard and then we actually etch it successfully. I think we can do it. I mean, the, the results we had on our side, they were decent. Um, if we get decent copper boards that the, that the traces don't fall off, that would be good.
Um, mm -hmm. I think the last time, I think the... <laughs> I think Tom was saying the copper boards, like the traces would fall off too easily. But we can make like fat lines, just minimal number of lines and fat lines. So we're not making anything complicated here. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually, it's uh, as little as possible. Yeah. And oh, some, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. So separate, um, separate the tracks and for the rest, you don't have to etch away everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The toughest part is just like separating the pins on a on Arduino but like if you put them like you have say two adjacent pins at 0.1 inch just make the leads to them like go away from each other so you have as much space as possible to not mess up you know yeah. I think it should be quite doable and that's what that takes the art component which is cool um, yeah um, what else so just to cover the curriculum for next time I gotta ship the stuff out I'll ship it um, I'm I'm trying to ship it like Saturday morning. If not, I'll ship the kits out to on like Monday morning because post office is closed. It takes a couple of days. If if it's Monday morning, you sh like Chris, you should get it like uh, when Thursday, I guess. Okay. Um, so when is the cutoff for for signups? Uh, cutoff officially is like t tonight, and uh, gotcha. okay, and then. So for New Zealand since I'm taking the kits there that's put it on Monday gotcha so we pretty much have these are the signups we're doing more advertising for next round um, yeah. yeah absolutely yeah. and then cool. I wanted to see like are you guys some I'm thinking that whether regardless of whether Hong Kong happens or not are we okay to do the focus on a film at maker for the next time because what I thought we can do Okay, there's a lot, of, a lot of noise back there. Can Sorry. Some, is that you, Chris, or is that who's, who's making noise? Yeah, that was me. That was me. Sorry. Okay. Um, for the the next one, which is April 28, are you guys comfortable with, with working on uh, the Filament Maker stuff? Because we have the simplified Filament Maker design, and what I could do is send out blade kits to everybody so blade for um, the film and grinder but I want to do like a real industrial grade shredder that still is super low cost so we can get metal blades that we can cut them out here and then use hex shaft which is off the shelf material and then uh, it's like base we can even do like a you could even do this, the actual structure for the shredder, like the chamber there, outside the blades. You can do that from wood even. So you can do like two by two by lumber. If we talk about a low way to do it, low cost way. But here's the thing on a drive, there'll be a great time to start experimenting with the gear downs, the split ring planetary gear downs, or even rubber, rubber pr printed belts. We can do all that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm thinking, get a get a either do a stepper motor like step nema 23 stepper motor would do the bill would fit the bill uh and then gear that down so it's a slow moving slow moving grinder but it's still you have that huge force on it so, so do like a 50 fold gear down on a nema 23rd with 23 which is already pretty strong so instead of the like if we take the budget out of the pie we can easily get the filament maker done for like 250 bucks including the the maker and a shredder we can do that that we can do if we do the 3d printed gear downs because that's the part that ends up costing a bit um and then the other part would be if you get away from the expensive bearings there's a lot of prior art on like 3d printed slew bearings or even like the metal balls in 3D printed housings. Those were those appear to be working pretty well. Like the one guy that's done a linear linear bearing with recirculating balls, like that's on a wiki. Like we gotta start playing with that kind of stuff. So maybe we can say, okay, uh, we'll get as far as we can on a shredder and film and maker, but I think it's important to to present it as an experimental session with all that so we still do the first four days and then the five days we we start tackling the shredder filament maker how do you guys feel about it think that's doable 
Yeah, I think that's a good plan. Which yeah, I'm excited about the filament maker. Industrially, that's the next thing. Plus, I love uh, working on more vitamin replacements, printed parts. In fact, I just posted in my log this morning. I, uh, uh, another job I'm working on in the shop just happens to be um, working on some timing belt type stuff. So I'm working oh. on a timing belt uh, open sketch for uh, nice for the D3 test. Us uh, a GT2 timing belt. Yes. Mm. So that's pretty tiny, and yeah, that's still doable. Yeah. Still oh yeah, doable. you know it, it, it works. I just have uh, the all the TPU I have is a little bit too elastic, so I'm wanting to try some of the less elastic TPUs. Uh, you can't don't want it to be stretchy, but yeah. it fits the t the, the gears the teeth fit. You tried so it actually. Down, yeah. Which materials uh, did you have in mind? Well, for gear down, there's two routes. One is the split the planetary gear downs or split split ring planetary gear downs just in plain PLA. Or you can do belts and sprockets that are made of rubber of TPU. So think about okay. like really big big belts, much bigger belts, mm -hmm. and then still attached yeah. to the NEMA 23. The NEMA 23 you can get for like uh, 25 bucks for a motor mm -hmm. like that or something like that. Do you think the, the planetary gears and PLA can handle that torque? Well, you just make them big enough, that's the thing. So if we could swarm, like if there's actually people signing up and we swarm on printing that with like 6 to 12 printers, you can print, you know, like really thick gears. You can even print them in sections if you design them, right? So you have the 6 to 12 printers printing parts at each location. We can do that for huge ones because you're still talking about 4,000 PSI. Uh, so think about that translates to a, a one inch gear being able to trans, transfer close to like 4,000 pounds of force. Like a, talking about big, like one inch and thicker, solid, 100% infill. We're yeah. talking about minimum hundreds maximum like thousands of pounds of power of force transmitted and you know that's one inch but if if they break you know make them one and a half inch two inch thick and it gets into the limits of how, of print time but with a 1.2 nozzles that's that actually gets quite manageable if you leave that overnight or whatever um so it's i mean it's pretty crazy stuff and we're definitely going to do that the first month so like the first month of summer x we're going to really go off on that um but so but here i think it's a great chance to start that so we can promote like now we can market this to to eco-conscious people we're talking about plastic recycling that's a that's a big deal for for the younger people who who are concerned about global warming because they have a long life ahead of them <laughs> yeah Popular yeah. economy. There, there will be. You will get a lot of more people. I think. Yeah. Or a new type of people. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe different kind of people is might be right. But I mean, the markets we span is like. I mean, we got so many different aspects of this work. So. Um, okay. Uh, what else? What else we need to cover? Anything else? Cause I gotta get running. I gotta ship a kit. D3D Pro. I've got <laughs> just a couple questions. I missed out on the start of the meeting. Um, just to confirm, no registrations for the Seattle area, correct? Uh, that's, I don't have one, right. Yeah, all mm -hmm. right. And we're closing it tonight. Tonight. And then um, I see April 28th as the start date for the, the next Filament Maker Focus Camp. Is yeah. that yeah. – I'm going to meet with some of the venue people here on Saturday, um, and I just want to – Yeah start getting them on board for the next camp yeah absolutely absolutely okay so pretty much and that's a tuesday right let's see what is that no i'm that? in may uh yes no it's not march april 28th well it is uh, well that's because that was when the hong kong thing was supposed to be ah uh. um but If that doesn't happen it makes more sense to start on a friday or friday or something no yeah friday or saturday would be my thoughts yeah so start so you still can have we have the friday harbor thing going on hopefully the 25th and the 26th oh yeah oh yeah that's right um 
So the news is uh, for everybody else, Jeremy's been talking to people. He sent out a bunch of emails to teachers, and it's one school that wants a two-day thing, like April 20, 26th. It'd be kind of... It'd be kind of fun to, to man combine them, roll those two together. Yeah, like the people who can only stay for two days, they start there and then either continue on or move it to the makerspace for the rest of the days in Bellingham. I don't know. Anyways, um, I will tell them that it's happening at the end of April, but we're not sure on the exact date. Do we want to? Were they available for like? Yeah, I mean, we can we can consider. Were they open to the weekend after that? I haven't. I haven't. I told them there would be one at the end of April, but we haven't discussed specifics. I just wanted to. I meet with them tomorrow at a volunteer event and um, kind of want to have an idea of what the next event is, so we can all get on board together and combine our marketing. April. It would make sense to do it like. So we have enough time to prepare and everything, get a good turnout, like maybe the first, the second. Of, of May, yeah, I agree. That's the next weekend. Mm -hmm. That gives us a lot of time between these, between what you guys have going on here, you know, next week and then. Yeah. Yeah, maybe do that. Okay. All right. Yep. So let's, I'd say for that do that now in case the the hong kong still happens i'm there the 28th mm -hmm. so i'll be out there anyway but i i think it does make sense to definitely start it to make it more optimal like on a weekend yeah mm -hmm. okay okay all right that's all i had sorry i missed it did um yeah recording it okay am I recording Perfect. it yeah i am recording it so that's good still got it what time is the meeting next week oh yeah because we're away right so we don't really wait that's just uh, i'm off in another... that'll be re that'll be the day before so you might be traveling but yeah it might be um, yeah and then... we should coordinate on um uh, like chris chris if you get a chance put up your video man do the, yeah, the test I need to. I need to. jessica to do that i should do that too but let's you know see if we can get it out of the way yeah but yeah so for next week's meeting since we're it's a little before game day uh do you guys still want to meet like i'll be like i don't know where i'll be the time zone will be way different uh <laughs> one one p.m it'd be 8 a.m my time but it'll be a day later already so i can't <laughs> i see we're one, one day ahead already uh, I'm kind of losing it. Yeah, so maybe um, maybe play it by ear. Uh, we'll just communicate on email. But you guys can still meet in the states if you want. But uh, continue the discussion. You guys still want to meet okay. the day before? Just check in. Well, I was more just gonna put out there like since there's not anybody up here. If you guys need support or you know if you want me to throw together some stuff in that last day or two, if we if we need anything, just reach out to me. I'm available. Cool. Um, cool. That very so, well might will be helpful. Yeah. 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 Or like go through some of the instruction stuff and just like you know maybe add some add some more clarity to anything you guys need. Just let me know. Uh, I I kind of cleared that weekend in the first couple of days of next that next week to be available. So Yeah, continue uh, like perfect perfecting the Pi tablet what we have. I mean definitely like if we can get a we have the the Pi tablet part library page, but they're like do, if you can we can start on a on an instructional that we actually run through in the camp. That's like okay. step by step. That'll be a definite, you know, point of uh, coordinating the events better. All right. Yeah. yeah. And I mentioned I'll be working on a on the Arduino part. Chris will do more on the Pi tablet. I'm gonna ask Jessica to write down the curriculum on the plotting tool chain. So yeah, we'll kind of collate it all together. And uh, my last point, my question when I was asking about the wiring, um, this uh, one day project, build your own Arduino uh, in the DIY Arduino page, this YouTube, that is the circuit that, that you're talking about for the straight breadboards, super simple one? Um, yeah, except that guy has the particular 
uh, converter, which right. is trouble, which which we can't get like in time. Like there's all other ones, but this, that particular one, like I can't find it anywhere. So. Um, I just want to make sure I have a really good reference for exactly what pin goes where, so I'm not trying to look at pictures and again trace wires. And, you know. Right, right. That I mean that one is good, but but I'm saying, do you have that particular converter? No, we don't. No. So we need to look at if you look at the DIY Arduino page under notes. Yeah. There's the FPDI version. Um, that one that seems to be the easiest to do. Um, okay because the parts are readily available okay so this youtube under the ftdi that's the one that that we're talking about doing well yeah yeah I, from what i've seen that one has parts that are available so the one i put if you refresh i put a check on that uh, yeah I that see. one that, you but can no simply one, get well, that chip oh, yeah. like the chip the specific chip that he he's pointing to yes you can get it um yeah so I was gonna make sure, like before I ship that or drop ship it, like I was gonna make sure that I'm confident that it it's the right one and it will work. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that sounds good. All right, so let's get going. I gotta I gotta get going here. Uh, we'll continue as we go and so forth. I will have a look which one Peter used. Um on his breadboard but i think it might uh, might have all been uh, the one the ftdi uh, yeah i'm gonna have a look tomorrow yeah yeah, yeah. yeah yeah let's see if we can confirm which one had the working track record yep yeah okay, okay. yeah i can contact with peter i met peter in uh in a house build in belize that was yeah, cool that's right. that was cool that's right. good guy um yeah so let's get going, and yeah, we'll talk right. soon. We'll be in touch on email. See you, everybody.